Hey everybody, I'm Michael Koval Anderson and this is another installment of Life-Sized Living. My TV series about urbanism, The Life-Sized City, has led me to spend a lot of time contemplating this idea of life-size. Here in my own home in Copenhagen, I enjoy living here, but I am constantly searching for things to change. That one chair, should it be over there? Should I move that plant? Should I replace that entire table? I'm constantly in a creative state of change. I'm not really worried about that, but sometimes it does get a little bit overwhelming as a creative type. I decided to enlist the help of a very good friend. This guy knows a thing or two about happiness. And I want to ask him what we can do in our homes to create a more happy, vibrant, life-size, livable environment. It really is the space in which we spend most of our time and invest most of our money, trying to have a nice place to live. He also has a lot to say about creating a happy workplace. I've invited him here to my home and I'm a little bit nervous to hear what he says when he looks at my apartment with his critical eyes about whether or not this really is a happy place for me and my kids. Hello, Alexander. Hey, Michael. Are you the happiest person I know? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> no? <laughs> Who could be happier than you? Seriously. Well, that's actually, it's a, I'm not a naturally happy person. A lot of people think I am given what I do. But uh, in fact, there's a long history of depression in my family mm -hmm. and I have to work at being happy. Uh, it's not something that comes naturally to me and I'm not a naturally happy person really? at all, no. But you figured out the formula for how to, no, I don't want to say force, right? But like how to, you know, provoke happiness well, in yourself. Yes, and in any case, and this is something we can all do, right? And, and I think the important point here is that it's not about being necessarily happy, it's about being happier, right? What can you do to make your own life better? And by the way, uh, the best way to do that is, of course, to make the people around you make their lives better. Mm -hmm. We know that from the research, right? The best way to be happy yourself is to do good things for others. Uh, I think that says something incredibly positive about us as a species. So having work with, with happiness at work, uh, which is my field for the last 16 years, that has definitely made me happier. But I am not by any stretch the happiest person I know uh, are probably not the happiest person you know. There right. are other people out there who are much better at being happy. You know those people who are just naturally exuberant and happy? Yeah, yeah they're so annoying. I know, I'm right? kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, they're, they're great. I was gonna say that if you didn't, but uh, of course. Some people have that skill. Uh, I had to learn it. Okay. So the reason I asked you here, I'm gonna get to that. Mm -hmm. um, you're in my home at the moment, as you know, right? And what a great place. Thank you. Um, but for, so first, I mean, just last week, uh, the, the latest happiness index came yes, out, right? Yes. And, uh, UN World Happiness Report. That's right. And I've seen um, that, that they're all, you know, everybody like Vice and all the news outlets are in Finland because they're number one. I remember yes. when they used to come to Denmark and talk to me. Because we used to be number you. one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, wow, what makes you so happy? I mean, yeah. all these journalists with these questions, right? But yeah. I mean, as I understand it, the question they ask in the in the survey is, "Are you content?" Yes. And if exactly. you're exactly if you're a Nordic, you're content. You have everything you need. Yes. And then the happiness is a headline later. But do you think that we are a happy country, Denmark, um, or are we moody and Nordic? <laughs> We're a little bit of both, right? And and I think my main takeaway from the from the UN World Happiness Report is, given that Finland just edged us out from the the number one place, right? I think my main takeaway is you got to find a Finn and piss them off. Yeah, <laughs> you got to retake our first plate. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, you're 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 touching on a very very important point uh, because there are two different things, two different concepts here, and people often lob them together and call them happiness. Uh, but there is life satisfaction, which is what they measure primarily in the UN World Happiness Report, and that is you know the main question is so all things considered. Uh, in your life, on a scale from 1 to 10, how satisfied are you with your life? And what would you say? How satisfied are you with your life on a scale from 1 to 10? Oh, well then the moody creative dude's good. Or he's on the one shoulder and the rest of me's on the other. But I would probably say 8. Yeah, and yeah. That's, that's, that is what most Danes say, right? Really? That's, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Most, uh, you know, Finland and Denmark have this average of about 7.7 .7 and they just etch us out and I hate that. <laughs> um, so that's, that's life satisfaction. And given that, you know, we live in a Scandinavian country, so we have, you know, a, a stable society, a good economy, uh, you know, a safe society. We have, you know, good government services. We have excellent bicycle infrastructure, uh, good healthcare, free, free higher education and all of that stuff. You know, how are we not going to be satisfied? Mm -hmm. But happiness, in my opinion, is something else. 
And that's more about how do you feel on a daily basis. And if you walk down a you know, main street in Copenhagen and you look at people's faces, you'll notice they don't necessarily look like they're having a good day. So like moment to moment, are people actually in a good mood? Are they experiencing positive emotions? Mm -hmm. um, and they also measure that. There's, there's a different study uh, that, that Gallup does where they actually call a thousand people in each country and ask them about their uh, recent, recent emotional stages. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, the Nordic countries are nowhere near the top 10. Oh wow, interesting. Yeah. yeah. And, you, and instead, what you have in the top 10 are a lot of uh, Latin and Middle American, uh, Central American nations like uh, Costa Rica, you have Mexico up there, because their people have, the, first of all, they have more emotions than we do, mm -hmm. and apparently they have more positive emotions than we do. Right. And if you ask me, you know, I don't know, what would you rather be? Would you rather be like satisfied? You know, yeah, I guess on the whole, my life is pretty satisfying. Or would you rather be happy so that moment to moment, you are quite often experiencing positive emotions? Yeah. What would you rather be? Oh wait, I don't know. I, I would prefer leaning towards the happy. Yes. I would think. Not, I don't want to be happy all the time. No, but I mean, I'd and, be, no, and yeah. nobody is. Nobody right? is. Luckily, yeah. yeah. Uh, some people think they have to fake being happy all the time, right? Yeah. Um, that, that's a very, uh, it's not a very Amer American attitude, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this this constant positivity, uh, you know, always look on the bright side and that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't think you can do that. Uh, you know, unhappiness is a part of life as, as much as happiness is. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, you are living a life. You are living your life in a way where you're happy most of the time and then occasionally you're unhappy and that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. And for me at least, I would rather be happy than satisfied. You know, I would rather have a life where, um, where you know, I wake up in the morning excited about what I do, I, I have a good day, you know, I talk to my friends, I'm with my family, um, I, and, and, and those things then make me happy. Mm -hmm. Rather than just having a life where, you know, yeah, I have enough money, I have enough to eat, I have a place to sleep, and, and, and those basic needs are fulfilled. Um, and that's, that's why I think that happiness is, and, and is, is way more important. And, and by the way, recent research just also does support that. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that your emotional state actually has a huge influence in, on you in many, many ways, just beyond feeling good. When we work creatively as we do, I mean, you know, yeah, like I said, I don't want to be happy all the time, but you know, because the downs, man, that means you're going you're gonna to bounce up again. And you, you, you don't want to be down when you're down, but man, you know that you're going to go up again. Right. Yes. At some point, you never know when. But I mean, so that roller coaster, there must be something in that, in a way, right? That that you know, that roller coaster is sort of more satisfactory to people like us. I think that roller coaster is going to happen regardless, whether you want to or not. There are going to be really shitty moments in your life, mm -hmm. right? You know, somebody you really like gets sick, or you know, somebody you know dies, or whatever, right? Or you know, uh, you get in, you know, you, uh, people get divorces, and, and you know, that kind of thing. Um, so expecting a life where you're always happy, that's just not going to happen. Um, and there's also something in being emotionally authentic and realizing that sometimes you are angry, sometimes you are sad, sometimes you are afraid, and maybe that is the exact right thing to be in that moment, mm -hmm. right? So saying to yourself, I should not be angry. Well, maybe you can do that. I, I probably could not. That would probably just make me more angry. <laughs> But maybe being angry is what actually causes you to act in that situation. I was, I was, in, a, I was in a job once, so this was back in my previous career when I was in tech, and I was with a client and we were working on an IT system and they kept changing their minds, right? They wanted this way, then the next day they wanted that way. And I, how am I gonna work like that, right? But being professional, I just, I just accepted all of that. And then one day, finally in a meeting, I snapped. They changed it again, I'm like, no. If you keep changing your mind on this, we're never getting it done. You need to figure out what you want. And that anger finally made them respect me. Yeah. Yeah. From that point on, we actually had a much better working relationship. And if I hadn't gotten angry in that moment and acknowledged it and acted on it, we never would have gotten to that point. So, so negative emotions are not something to be overcome or something to be, you know, denied. It's, it's it, when you experience negative emotions, it's usually a sign that something is wrong and you should do something about it. It's not really maybe a sustainable business model for a happy country that we have to wait <laughs> for everybody to just like explode and no. then they go, oh, now I understand you, right? No. no, I mean, obviously we need to design it into our lifestyle and our society, right? Yeah. Yes, but, if yeah. they, but, but it, it is going to happen, right? You know, you know if, you, if you work a whole career, at one point you will have a terrible co-worker or a horrible boss. Mm -hmm. and, and that will cause a lot of negative emotions. Are you just going to eat those, emotion, those emotions or are you going to act on them? That's the question. Right. And that requires emotional authenticity. It's not about always being happy and positive. If somebody's always happy and positive, there's something wrong with them. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm wondering, I'm 
working for myself at the moment. Yeah. And so I think I'm probably like the worst boss and the worst employee. I feel uh, you. <laughs> as well as the best, right? But I mean, you have those days, right? Yeah, exactly. So we first met each other nine years ago at TEDx Copenhagen. Yes. We both uh, were doing our thing on stage there. Yeah. Well, we kind of live a similar life in a way. Yes. Lots of keynotes, lots of consultancy and whatnot. Yeah. In different areas, we yeah. each have our, you know, like our cause, yeah. uh, our, you know, uh, uh, our battle cry. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I remember you, you talking and you have done a lot about the, you know, happiness in, the, you know, in your life mm -hmm. uh, and also in the workplace. The main uh, three simple arguments, really. Uh, first of all, happiness at work is a really good thing. So having a job you actually enjoy is good for you as a person. Mm -hmm. It's actually also good for the workplace and happy companies make more money. There's a ton of research to support that. Uh, secondly, what really makes us happy at work is not what most people think. Because a lot of people, you know, what would make you happy at work? And people say a raise, give me a bonus, give me a promotion, give me a, you know, a gym in the office or free fruit or better coffee or whatever. Mm -hmm. They have, they have, those things have nothing to do with happiness at work. Uh, what really makes us happy at work is results and relationships. So results is that feeling that you do good work and you work on something you believe in that matters to you, where you make a positive difference in the world. And relationships is that feeling of belonging, right? Um, that 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 you are, you know, you you have great coworkers, good relationship with your. If you're the manager, good relationship with your employees. If you're the employee, good relationship with the manager, that kind of thing, right? Um, basically, that feeling that you belong. And then third, I think the third point is that a lot of a lot of the things that that create a happy workplace are actually really really simple. Mm -hmm. This is not rocket science, um, and anyone can do it. Uh, any workplace can be a happy workplace as long as you're not screwing up the planet, right? Um, any workplace can be a happy workplace, and, and each and every one of us can do something to become happy at work. Uh, and, and if we do find ourselves stuck in a workplace that is completely horrible, we can quit and get the hell out of there and go work somewhere better. Mm -hmm. Those are our three main points, and that's what we've been teaching for the last uh, 16 years. I work with cities. Mm -hmm. uh, in my TV series, The Life Size City, is all about people making cities better. Yeah. Happier, probably, as well, right? I yes. mean, it's all inherently uh, connected. I wanted to sort of explore my own home mm -hmm. and my neighborhood yeah. and my city, right? Uh, sort of the rings in the water. But I was wondering if anybody on the planet has an answer. Uh, how do I ensure a happy home? Yeah. I feel like I like my apartment. Mm -hmm. I do feel that um, when I come home, it's for seven years I've been living in this apartment. Whenever I come home, I've never had a moment of saying, oh, this apartment's perfect. Yeah. Oh my God. It's like a museum piece. <laughs> I shall just relax like I'm in an interior design magazine and drink my tea. I mean, I have that sort of creative discontent. Fine. Yeah. But how do I ensure that I have a happy home for myself or for me and my kids or generally? Have you seen a uh, Fight Club, the movie? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So at the beginning of the movie, right, he's, he's looking through the, the Fernie catalog, which is a very thinly disguised Ikea catalog. Right. And he's looking, you know, what coffee table defines me as a person? <laughs> and he had this dream that his home would be complete, right? And that's the last uh, couch he'll ever have to buy. And then once he had that perfect home, he would be complete as a person. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, Tyler Durden blows up his home with a, with a, a, a leaky gas thing, right? right? right. Um, so... Is this advice for me or what? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just so easy to fall into that trap that, you know, there is a perfect home and it's about how good it looks. I don't, I don't think that at all. Uh, I, you know, I look around your home and it looks, mm. it looks really cool, like a lot of cool stuff. So yeah, there's clearly a lot of history here and stuff from all around the world, right? That's great. For me, you know, it's not about the home, it's about the people in it. Mm -hmm. And what I like about your home is that it's not fancy, right? It's not expensive, it's not the latest designer whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you could get a, you could get a, a you know, a, a chair or a coffee table that will cost you tens of thousands of kroner. Uh, that stuff doesn't really matter. What matters is that you have a home that you can use where you're not afraid to invite people in and that will cause wear and tear on the home. But that's actually what makes us happy. It's not the home itself. It was, it's what happens in the home, mm -hmm. right? So having that home that is lived in like a comfortable pair of shoes, not like a, a perfectly new pair of shiny shoes, right? Yeah. But those shoes that you've worn a hundred times and you're not afraid to scuff them once more because they're already, you know, lived in and they look cool mm -hmm. because they've been used. That's the kind of home that I see here, right? Mm -hmm. In the best possible way. Uh, it reminds me of there's my favorite cafe in Copenhagen is the Laundromat Cafe. Oh, right? yeah. uh, this crazy Icelandic guy called Friedrich has uh, three of them around Copenhagen. And his chairs are all secondhand chairs that he, you know, buys in stores around the city. And then he paints them all the same brown and every, you know, twice a year he'll repaint them. 
So if somebody drops a chair, if somebody puts their shoes up on a chair, he doesn't care. Yeah. He wants you to feel at home and just be yourself, right? Uh, I, was in a, I was in a very fancy cafe uh, in downtown Copenhagen a few years ago, and I, you know, I take my shoes off, put my stocking feet up on a chair, and the owner came over and yelled at me. <laughs> really? You know, you, wh- who do you think you are? You can't put your, you know, stocking feet on a chair. I'm like, okay, yeah. and I, I never came back to that place, right? So, but they're nice socks. Come on, exactly, <laughs> you know? exactly. I don't get it. Okay. So for me, it's it, it's about the relationships, right? Do you have the kind of uh, home where you can invite friends over and you can have a late night drinking whiskey and red wine and 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 not be afraid to spill red wine on your fancy Persian rug or mm-hmm. whatever, right? Yeah. Um, some homes, you know, some people try to create these homes that are so picture perfect mm-hmm. that you, you, you're, you're almost afraid to fart. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Cause the place looks that good. Right. And, yeah. and you know, what if I scuff the, the wallpaper or what if I, you know, scratch the table or something? Yeah. Um, and that would make you afraid to live in it. Um, so that I think for me, a, a home is nothing, it's worth nothing without the people in it. Mm-hmm. So if you have the kind of home, you know, that invites people in, invites them to be themselves, where you can have fun, hang out, and be yourselves. Now this is, I mean, this is the three principles in a way of, of Danish design, right? Functional, practical, elegant. Yes. You're saying maybe I'm not as elegant with my home as, yeah. as uh, a, well. And, and that's a good thing. Fun, if you want funky instead of elegant, I think that's all right. You know, that's a personal taste. But if it's functional and practical, if it works for the people who live in it. Exactly. And rather than elegant, because I think elegant is, gives you that, I'm afraid to, to damage this in some way, right? Yeah. Instead of elegant, I'd go with quirky, funky, or even personal. So it's yours, mm-hmm. right? This home is identifiably yours. Whereas a lot of other people's homes are, you know, straight from the, you know, the kitchen catalog of HTH yeah, or yeah. whatever, right? Um, and, and there are probably a million other kitchens that look just the same or indistinguishable from it, right? Yeah. And, and, and your home is not like that. Your home is, is, is different and personal and yours. Um, so I, I think, for me, at least, it's it's really not about the home. It is about the people in it, and and what the home, what kind of interactions you invite mm-hmm. with the kind of home you have. I had Airbnb guests for five years, oh. uh, renting a room, but I, they rented a, the small room. Mm-hmm. I thought, ooh, international people, constant flow of visitors, great for me and the kids. That's the kind of home I always wanted, right? The yeah. kind of home I grew up in, actually. Where, you know, you get a lot from your mom, right? But yeah. um, so I, I, a lot, all the guests through years said, oh my God, this is so, so nice. And I was always like, really? I'm, mm-hmm. I'm told that that table irritates me and I still don't know what to do with that plant. And, uh, you know, so I was, but it made me realize, wow, people think I have a nice home. So mm-hmm. that's nice. Yeah. Um, but I, I started really trying to think differently about it. Um, and it feels also in the eyes of the people looking at it uh, from the rest of the world, that it's, 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 it's very Danish. Oh my God, this is so Danish. I think really you just need hardwood floors for like a foreigner to think <laughs> Danish or, Sc- or Scandinavian. Sure. But I mean, I'm gonna ask One about- One of these has super lips tables. Yeah, but yeah, I mean- That's very Danish. I have a couple of nice designer things like every Dane does, you know, uh, regardless of age, you try to get something cool. I got Arne Jakobsen chair, I got the ellipse table, I got a few I, things. Yeah, right? I see it right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, this sort of minimalism that we're known for in, yeah. in Denmark, and can you draw a connection between our minimalistic desires and the fact that we lead uncluttered lives and are therefore maybe more content, satisfied, happy? Yes, I would argue that that you know one thing is is when you have a, a really open living room like yours here, you have more room for people, right? If you had filled that with overstuffed sofas and and you know easy chairs yeah. and that kind of thing, where would the people be, right? Uh, that way you have more room for anything and whatever activity you can come up with with, with your guests and your friends and your family. Mm-hmm. Um, I got room for Twister in there. There you go. As well as a nice sofa to relax <laughs> you on can, You can dance there, right? <laughs> totally break yeah. dance. I've gone, to, I've gone to American homes that were, you know, every available square inch was filled with whatever, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that's one aspect. And then I think the other aspect is, uh, you know, you could spend a lot of money on, on, on filling your home with fancy stuff, but mm-hmm. then you can't spend that money on other stuff like experiences, right. uh, travel, uh, you know, late boozy nights on the town or going out dancing or whatever. Um, and, and those things are probably going to make you way happier than, than you know, a, a kitchen cupboard full of, of $100 plates. Yeah. Um, uh, in our home, I think we have all our, you know, kitchenware is 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 either secondhand or or cheap IKEA stuff. Right. Yeah. Because I don't, you know, I don't really care if my plate is fancy and uh, <laughs> a brand name designer. Right. Yeah. Who gives a, who gives a shit? Yeah. 
uh, you know, you eat off it. Um, so when we set a table for 10 friends, there are going to be three or four different kinds of plates. And I don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's not what makes it a good dinner. What makes it a good dinner is the people and the conversation and the interactions. Yeah. And that way, if somebody drops a champagne glass, it's not a $500 crystal whatever. It's a freaking Ikea 20 kroner uh, three box champagne glass and nobody gives a shit. Yeah. You just ride your bike out to Ikea and get a new one, right? Or a new set, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. All right. It doesn't really matter, is your point. Just make sure I have cool people visiting me in my home and then everything's fine, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Right. And, and I think it's so easy to get stuck in the other trap um, where, where you know, you're keeping up with the Joneses because somebody you know got a, you know, a, a really expensive dining room table or whatever. Uh, but that's, that's not what makes a home good. That's not what makes a home happy. It, re it really is. In fact, it can, it can make the home less happy because now you're afraid to invite people over because they might spill the tomato sauce on your fancy dining room table yeah, yeah. and you'll never get the stain out and, yeah. and you spend so much money on it. And the rest of the night after it happens, that's all you're thinking about. You're not even with your, you know, you're just pissed or whatever, right? Yeah. There right. you go. Okay. So if we could create a happy home environment yeah. um, through the people you invite in, also maybe, you know, being true to yourself, not mm -hmm. a magazine. How, what kind of parallels are important between our home life that we design ourselves and our work life? which is by and large designed by other people and yeah. maybe they're good or not, right? Yeah. So, I mean, but how, what's a good way to com combine those two for like people like us who have to do the both, right? I think businesses fall into the exact same trap. They want to be a good workplace. So they, you know, we have to have fancy designer desks and off air and office chairs and, and you know, uh, expensive art works on the walls and that kind of thing. Um, but again, that's not what makes employees happy. You know, you need a desk, yes, but it doesn't need to be a does need to be a you know a ten thousand dollar you know a designer desk. It really doesn't. Uh, it could be from IKEA. <laughs> it would be perfectly service uh, perfectly serviceable desk. Yeah. Uh, just to give you an example, I went to um, I went to visit one of the big pharmaceutical companies in Switzerland. I'm not going to mention the name, but you know it. It's a very very big one. <laughs> And they have this beautiful campus in this city, tons of buildings, some of the old ones from them when they were grounded, founded a hundred years ago, and also some new ones. And the new buildings are designed by like star architects. Mm -hmm. The one I went to was designed by the same guy who did the Bird's Nest Stadium in Beijing. Super sleek, super fancy. And the mm -hmm. offices are look amazing, right? Uh, design of furniture, uh, art, you know, original art, paintings on the wall, that kind of thing. Employees fucking hated it. Mm -hmm. They found the building cold, sterile, impersonal and and it was just was not them and here's the thing you couldn't even customize your own office so you know if you wanted a poster or a painting on the wall you could pick from a catalog <laughs> but you couldn't hang your own wow right that was just not allowed because uh, all the world uh, all the walls were glass so you could look into the building from the outside and and that would affect the the, the visual aesthetic of the the building wow okay. uh, i was told that the architect lived nearby he would drive past occasionally and if he saw something unauthorized hanging somewhere, he'd call building maintenance and they'd come and take it down. Oh man. So this was hugely expensive and people hated it, yeah. right? So an office shouldn't be fancy or, you know, look expensive. It should be, what should it be? It's homey, right? You should feel at home here. You should put your own, be able to put your own finishing touches on it, mm -hmm. uh, customize your own office environment, uh, have, uh, have an influence on what the place looks like. Um, one of the coolest offices I've seen is in Vegas, uh, where at, at Zappos, you know Zappos, right? Online retailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Amazing culture, really great workplace. I've been there, I don't know, five or six times. Um, and and their offices are not. It's basically a cubicle form, right? Cubicles like like you see in, in in every office in America, right? But every every employee has complete freedom to decorate their own cubicle, and each team has sort of a row of cubicles, and they pick the theme. Okay. So, for instance, that they're an online retailer, they sell clothes and shoes online, right? So the the, the team that sells uh, Western gear, like cowboy boots and hats and that kind of thing, they of course have a Western theme and cactuses and that kind of thing, right? Uh -huh. uh, the 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 kids apparel team, they have like a, a child's furniture from IKEA, that kind of thing. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so they've customized it the way they like it. It's theirs. It's personal. And they're allowed they, to. They're encouraged and they're, to. They're encouraged. That they own it. It's yeah. ours, right? Also, it all looks different and also look, it all looks really fun mm -hmm. and weird and wacky and, and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, the IT department had a pig uh, stuck to the ceiling, a spider pig. Right, right? okay, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, so, so and, and that works way better than something that is you know, designed by an architect that looks amazing, that's so expensive that you, you know, it looks so fancy that you're you know, afraid to be yourself in that office space. Same so, as the apartment, right? If you try to same, copy a magazine, 
you're going to be worried. You're going to be like, you know, you're just walking on eggshells in your own damn home, right? It's the exact same thing. Yeah. And, and going back to the people in it, it's, it is about creating a, uh, an office environment where people can be themselves, but where can, they can also interact, right? Where you create interaction between people. Because I think in the Western world, at least, you know, we're quite an individualistic culture um, and it's hard for us to connect with other people. So you have to some, in some way encourage that. I think the coolest example I've seen was a company in London called What If Innovation, where the, the, they had a five-story building and the ground floor was a combination of a reception, meeting rooms, uh, coffee, water coolers, uh, copiers, printers, uh, lockers, and, and pretty much everything else that you might need throughout the day. Right. So whether you were greeting a guest or you had a meeting or you needed a printout or whatever, you'd go there. And you'd run into people. They created all these collisions. Yeah. So you go, hey, Michael, how are you today? Uh, what's up with that project? Did you talk to that client? And you could have all of those interactions. It's like a city square, right? Which we know mm -hmm. from urbanism is incredibly important, right? Wow. Ta -da. And that's, I think I think the same cool. parallel goes with cities, actually. That again, we're living in individualistic times. Um, we need cities that encourage collisions, where you meet people who are not like you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you very much, Alexander. High Mark. five. Absolute pleasure. Boom. Cool.